takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But you probably won't. You're busy. Kids, work. Show coming back in 48 seconds. So let's do this now. Hold up one finger if you're a man. Women, zero. Three more fingers if you're over 60. Two over 50. One over 40. If you're not sure, keep in mind you're sitting on a couch right now. So one more finger if you're not very active. One finger if yes, zero if no. One yes, zero no. Next, find the body type that looks most like you and hold up that many fingers while I look around awkwardly. And that's it. If you're holding up five fingers or more, you probably have prediabetes. Sorry to be so blunt, but hey, you're busy. Just go to the site. Welcome to Healthy Cleveland. I'm your host, Leah Haslidge, and today's topic is on Minority Health Month and the resources that are offered. I'd like to welcome our guest, Francis Mills, who is the director of the City of Cleveland Department of Minority Health, and Christina Austin, who is the chief marketing officer for The Gathering Place. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Let's start off by talking about what is Minority Health Month? Why is it significant? Well, Minority Health Month in the state of Ohio, it was established in 1989 as a vehicle to raise awareness about health disparities in the community, particularly among African American, Latino, Native American, and Asian popularities because those are the communities that suffer the most from health disparities when we're talking about cancer, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, and a number of other diseases that are considered chronic health conditions. And so Minority Health Month was established to give people the opportunity in the community to participate in health screenings, to attend educational events. It allows us to include grassroots organizations and health efforts. And so by the time the year 2000 came, it had become a nationwide event. So all over the country in the month of April, cities and communities are celebrating Minority Health Month. Why is it so significant though, especially in our community? In our community, our African American community, our Latino community, they're really suffering from health disparities. Uh, with, as far as cancer is concerned, African Americans are 1.5 times more likely to have a cancer diagnosis. Diabetes, if you live in the state of Ohio and you're African American, you're 77 times more likely to get a diagnosis of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And so these are diseases that in some way can if you understand your family history, if you're able to participate in appropriate screenings, you can help your diagnosis even if you have a family history. And so we encourage people to learn more about the diseases, to know their numbers, and when we say know your numbers, know what your high blood pressure is, know what your cholesterol is, know what your blood sugar level is, and go out and get those appropriate screenings that are age appropriate, whether it's for breast, whether it's for prostate, and get these things checked on a regular basis, and always have a primary care physician and see your doctor. Why do you think there's so many disparities amongst the communities when it comes to, it comes to the health? Well, that's a large question, a broad question that some of it has to do with specific health behaviors that individuals participate in. So if you smoke, you have a much greater chance to contract lung cancer. Some of the issues are structural in terms of access to care. Uh, poverty has to do with education. And so when we talk about health, 
there are many factors that contribute to good health, but a lot of times the focus is placed on, well, that individual is doing this to themselves or that individual is overweight, when health behaviors only account for 30 to 40 percent of a health outcome. And so a lot of times it's where you live can dictate your life expectancy. So kind of nature versus nurture in that sense. What is being done to observe uh, Minority Health Month this year? Well, this year for the month of April, we have three events that are going on in the city. The first event is a health equity symposium. We're gathering leaders from the business community, faith community, educational community, and health community to talk about how can we as a city and as a region advance health equity and what it takes to do that. And so we have a number of dynamic keynote speakers. We have Chip Allen coming up from the Ohio Department of Health, and we also have Rakaya Yearby, who is the Associate Director of Inclusion, and I want to get it right, <laughs> Inclusiveness and Diversity out of the School of Law at Case Western Reserve University. Wonderful. Uh, any partnerships with other organizations? Absolutely. On the 21st of April, we are hosting, co-sponsoring, a community education event on cancer called the ABCs of Cancer in the African American Community. And we have partnered with the Gathering Place that is located in Beechwood and Westlake to partner with us on that event. That's great. Well, and that leads to you, Christina. Tell us about The Gathering Place. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you for the opportunity. So The Gathering Place is a cancer support center, and we've been providing free programs and services to the community since January of 2000. And so people wonder, okay, so a cancer support center, what, what does that really mean? What do you do? And when you think about a cancer diagnosis, many people often think about the treatment that an individual has to go through, the, the surgery, the chemo, the radiation. But if you think about it even more, cancer impacts an individual socially, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And it doesn't just impact the person with the diagnosis, it impacts their entire family, whoever's in their support network. Mm -hmm. So at The Gathering Place, all of our free programs and services are designed to support that individual and that family through the cancer diagnosis, to help them cope with the emotional impact of the cancer, to help them cope with the spiritual and the physical impact of the cancer diagnosis. And we do that through a number of programs that include individual support, it includes support groups, educational workshops and lectures. We have a wig salon where women can get a free wig. We have a medical librarian who can really help people understand this new language that all of a sudden they're hearing as they're going through a cancer diagnosis. And sometimes people will hop on the internet and start to research information and come up with things that can be inaccurate, um, can be very frightening um, or sometimes inappropriate for their particular type of diagnosis. So our medical librarian can sit down with individuals, she'll research information for them or help them understand what are the appropriate sites to go through and then kind of um, navigate through all that information, help them understand how, what kind of questions should you be asking your physician, your healthcare team. So it's a, a wide range of programs and services so that we can meet people where they are and help them manage and cope with the style that they're accustomed to and then also learn new coping skills to help them navigate through that entire journey. Director Mills had mentioned it's in Beechwood and Westlake, your two locations, but you offer free transportation, right? We do, and, and we serve people all over Northeast Ohio, and so our transportation is provided for those who do not have transportation because we recognize that even though our programs and services are free of charge, if you cannot get to the gathering place because you don't have transportation, then it doesn't matter that we have great programs that are free of charge. So we provide free transportation for those who do not have transportation, and we also provide childcare because we recognize that for some people they might be coming to an evening program, or they, they have a young child that they're caring for during the day and they want to come for a program, and so what do, what do I do with my three-year-old? What do I do with my five-year-old? And so if you call the gathering place in advance, then we can provide child care during the time that that individual is in a program. And because um, I was on your website, Gathering Place is a fantastic website, by the way. Thank you. Um, you offer 
things for children and teenagers that, that are dealing with loved ones that are going through cancer. Exactly. So when I was saying earlier, when, when you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis in the family, it doesn't just impact that person diagnosed. It's, it's impacting everyone. So if you think about it, the person that's diagnosed has some of their own issues that they're dealing with. Um, some of the fear that they might be experiencing, anxiety, how to, how to manage the rest of their life with this cancer diagnosis. But the family, they also have concerns. They also have fears and, and, and are feeling some anxiety. So being able to give children, teens, and adults an opportunity to come to a place where they can be supported, where they can learn new coping skills or enhance the coping skills that they already have. And so that, that's what people are doing when they, when they walk to the doors of the gathering place. Now you had mentioned the uh, cancer educational event coming up. Can you talk about that a little bit more so our viewers yes, we, get, we get them out there? <laughs> so the program is going to be from 10 to 2 on Saturday, um, April 21st. And, and the, the, there, there are three different things that, that we're kind of taking a look at with regards to helping people understand cancer and just navigating the healthcare system in general. So we're going to have a panel of healthcare professionals and really talking about how to deal with some of the fears that people face around cancer, how to navigate the healthcare system, and even how to interact with your healthcare team. Because when we were talking about disparities a little bit earlier, sometimes, sometimes individuals, especially those from the minority communities, um, are concerned about how they, imp how they interact with their healthcare professional. There's an issue sometimes for people around trust mm -hmm. because of some of the different issues that have taken place throughout history with African Americans and research and healthcare. And so we want to give them an opportunity to ask questions and talk with healthcare professionals who look like them so that they can really understand how to navigate the system, how to advocate for themselves, and then also to understand about resources, what resources are available, and how to access and utilize those resources. And there are a lot of resources out there that people aren't aware of. Are there any other resources that you would like to talk about that our viewers need to know about through the Office of Minority Health, through Gathering Place? Well, one of the things that the office likes to do, we don't offer programs directly, but we have a wide range of collaborative partnerships. So if there's something that a resident is looking for in the community, we may not have it, but we can likely point them in a direction or link them with a provider who would be able to assist them. One of the things Chris talked about was the, the fear and mistrust around medical professionals. That is a emerging and persistent theme that I continue to hear out in the field. I spend a lot of time in the field doing educational presentations and also interacting with the public at health fairs and other events. And I always ask one question, do you know your numbers? The second question, do you know your family history? Third question, when was the last time you saw your primary care physician? Fourth question, have you had age-appropriate screening? Generally for a woman, it's have you had your mammogram? For a man, have you, if you're over 40, have you had your prostate exam? And overwhelmingly, I hear around the issue of cancer, I don't want to know. I'm afraid to take the test or I won't take the test. Or as a philosophy, I don't deal with health care professionals. And so it is to our detriment as a community and as individuals that we don't access and avail of services that are out there. And that is why the statistical data comes in where we see communities getting into care at much later stages of cancer where it could have been a stage one, it's a stage three or a stage four. And then that, of course, impacts mortality. That's why early detection is key. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, very important. How did the Office of Minority Health and Gathering Place partner up? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's an interesting question. And, and I don't know if we can even, maybe through Minority Health Alliance. So I, I think one of the things that's significant in what Francis was talking about and being in the community, that's also significant for the Gathering Place, making sure that people are aware of all the services that we provide. 
So we serve on various committees in the community so that we are connecting with other organizations. Again, making sure that we're networking, making sure that we are getting the word out about what we do and understanding what other resources exist. So as people come to the gathering place, we can share information about um, other services that maybe we don't provide, but that people need. And so I think we connected through the Minority Health Alliance, which is an organization that brings all kinds of healthcare professionals together to network, to educate, to um, provide information and to collaborate. And so it, it just makes sense that for the gathering place, everyone is impacted by a cancer diagnosis. It does not discriminate. It's not, it doesn't matter about how much money you make, what your racial background or ethnicity is, um, what your gender is or anything like that. It, it, it impacts everyone. And so we wanna make sure that everyone is aware of these resources and the Cleveland Office of Minority Health is looking at how do we make sure that we're impacting the minority communities in Cleveland and making sure they're getting the best access to care and resources. And so it, it just was a natural fit that, that we would work together and, and try to reach as many people as possible. And it's been a great partnership as we begin to have those discussions. All of the hospital systems said, we would like to be on board. We would like to support that effort. We would like to provide opportunities for screening. So at the event, uh, UH will be represented, Cleveland Clinic will be represented, the Cancer Disparity Center will be represented. So a great deal of cancer serving organizations will be out with us as we get this message out to the people. So we're inviting the community to come and join us at Affinity Baptist Church, 4411 East 175th Street in the Lee Miles community on Saturday, April the 21st from 10 to 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. It's a free program, so they don't have to worry. And, and we're going to even provide lunch for people. So I think that's mm -hmm. important for people to know. A healthy lunch, <laughs> because how, how we treat our bodies, how we eat, how we become physical is also very important. And it's a lot of what we do at the Gathering Place. Nutrition and, mm -hmm. and um, exercise programs are a significant part of what we provide because everything is impacted when you're going mm -hmm. through a cancer diagnosis. So when people do go through cancer, they have questions about how should I change my diet? How can I eat more healthy? How does sugar impact me? You know, what should I be doing with regards to even eating meat? How do I change my lifestyle behaviors? And so we have a registered dietitian who meets with individuals, who meets with families, but we also offer hands-on cooking classes so that it's not just about saying to a person, eat more healthy, because what does that really mean? Right. Yeah. But if you can teach people and you can help them to find out why a certain food is more healthy, how to cook that food, and then have an opportunity to actually taste that food. I know before starting to work at the gathering place, I had never heard of quinoa. Yeah. Now it's something that I eat all the time. It's an ancient grain, has lots of protein, and is very good for you. And so there are other people, kale, you know, yeah. what is kale? How do I cook kale? Why is it beneficial for me to eat? And so we have those types of programs at the Gathering Place to help families understand about nutrition and find ways to cook these healthy foods. And so when we have programs, whether it's at the Gathering Place or we're collaborating mm -hmm. in the community, you have to lead by example. So mm -hmm. we'll have a, a wonderful lunch, but it will be very healthy, but very delicious. And so we, <laughs> we really encourage people to come out because information is power, knowledge mm -hmm. is power. And so if you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis, if you have family members that are dealing with a cancer diagnosis, or you just want to arm yourself with information so that you can be the, the most healthy that you can be, then come out to this program because you'll have a chance to interact with healthcare professionals, you'll have a chance to, to ask questions. We're gonna have a panel of cancer survivors so they can talk about how they've been impacted by cancer, um, kind of what were the resources that they utilized? Why did they reach out mm -hmm. for resources? You know, what was impacting them that they felt that they need, needed help? And to hear from these cancer survivors that it's okay to ask for help mm -hmm. and it's okay to receive help. That piece, I think, is extremely important. Having someone that's been through it always is beneficial because it you is. know you're not alone. Exactly, right. yeah. exactly. And I think that's why some people end up coming to the gathering place because they do feel alone. Not to say that they're not getting support from their family and friends and community, mm -hmm. but they want to interact with individuals who are going through a similar journey or who have gone through that journey because they can learn from each other and support each other. Is there anything that you think the viewers should know about the Office of Minority Health or the Gathering Place? Well, if folks have questions or need more information, they can contact 
the office at 216-664-3052 or by email at fmills at city.cleveland.oh.us. And also, I think one of the things that we've been talking about around that issue of fear is that in our tagline for for our community ads, you know, fear is a, not a reason not to take action. And so we want to help people move through that fear so that they will be able to position themselves to achieve the best level of health possible for them. Christina. And I think for the gathering place, I just want people to know that we are a drop-in center. And what that means is that you don't have to have an appointment to come to the gathering place. And part of that is because of fear. Mm -hmm. People are afraid to ask for help. Um, people, when you, when you walk through the doors of the gathering place, you're acknowledging, I have a cancer diagnosis or someone I love has a cancer diagnosis and I need some help. So we try to make it as easy as possible to access that help. So when you wake up and say, okay, this is the day I, I need to go, that you walk through the door, there's gonna be a staff person there to provide you with a tour, to give you information, to start talking with you and interacting with you, get you connected to programs. You can call us though, if, that's, if you want that to be your first step. And so that number is 216-595-9546. You can go to our website and find a wealth of information, even register for programs, and that's touchedbycancer.org or you can come visit us in Beechwood or Westlake. Perfect. Well, Christina, thank you so much for being here and all the information at the Gathering Place. Dr. Mills, you're gonna hang tight. We're gonna keep you around for a little bit longer. And when we return to Healthy Cleveland, we're gonna be with Director Mills and with Tammy Jones, who is with the City of Cleveland's Office uh, of Public Health, and she is with the Office of HIV AIDS Services. So stay tuned for more Healthy Cleveland. One fifty over ninety. One eighty over one eleven. One sixty over one ten. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it, or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. Hi, I'm Mayor Frank Jackson. You've probably seen media coverage of the growing opioid epidemic in Northeast Ohio. But what you might not know is how many of these tragedies begin with a seemingly innocent prescription for pain medication. That is why we're teaming with the Cuyahoga County Opiate Marketing Task Force to encourage you to know the risk. Go to the website on your screen to learn which pills are opiates, and alternative ways of dealing with pain, which starts as a prescription can end with addiction, so know the risk. I understand. I know it's not your typical resume. Okay, well. But Candidate. But I've been working double shifts just to pay for books. I've been raising my two little brothers. I'm determined, driven, motivated. Isn't that what you're looking for? Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Welcome back to Healthy Cleveland. I'm your host, Leah Haslidge, and today we're talking about Minority Health Month and the resources that are available. And we're gonna be talking now about healthy relationships. 
Welcome back, Francis Mills, who's the Thank director you. of the City of Cleveland's Department of Minority Health. And now our new guest, Tammy Jones, who's um, from the City of Cleveland's Department of Public Health's uh, HIV and AIDS Services. I get that correct? Yes. <laughs> so, Tammy, tell us a little bit about HIV AIDS prevention that's going on right now in our community. Okay. Um, HIV is a chronic disease that is, you know, affecting every individual across the city, across the state, and across the U.S. So our main goal is to try to prevent and hopefully in the near future eliminate the spread of HIV AIDS, you know, within our communities. So the Cleveland Department of Public Health, we provide services um, that includes HIV testing, counseling and referral services, HIV education, um, also we work with community partners. Um, we have social media, um, social awareness campaigns that are relevant to our community. So we really wanted to increase the awareness of HIV and encourage people to take control of their um, sexual health. Are these services mostly free? Yes, all of our services are free. We work with a lot of community partners. So you can get um, HIV testing for free um, at our local um, health clinics, J. Glenn Smith on the east side and Thomas McCafferty on the west side. And we have also other partners within the community that offer HIV testing and as I said, education, um, case management services. And we also work with individuals who are um, positive for HIV and offer housing assistance for them. When it comes to HIV, AIDS, STDs in the community, what do you think is the biggest misconception? Um, I would say the disparity that HIV is not rising among our youth. Our youth group, especially um, youth of color who identify as MSM, which is men who have sex with men, and that is a rapidly growing population contracting this disease. You know, there's a lot of stigma in the community. Um, there is a lot of shame going on. And the main issue here is we need to address healthy relationships and honesty mm -hmm. um, and clear um, conversations between individuals who decide to engage in sexual relations with each other. So you think education then is the biggest key when it comes to this? Absolutely. And the ability just to have open and honest discussion like Tammy said. One of the things that was startling to I think both of us in 2016 when I first started with the Office of Minority Health, the Center for Disease Control came out with statistics around MSM's likelihood of contracting an HIV diagnosis. For African American men, one in two MSMs would contract an HIV diagnosis in their lifetime and one in 37 Latino MSMs would contract an a the HIV diagnosis in their lifetime. And so when we talk about the implications of men who have sex with men, who sometimes may have sex with women, that is a huge issue for those communities and not to be able to talk about sexual issues in an in a knowledgeable and open and clear-cut manner is a huge issue that has far-reaching implications. In our community, people, because of Magic Johnson, they believe that, oh, I get HIV, I can live. Okay. But HIV, the thought that it is now a chronic disease, really diminishes the prevention message that we would like to have out there, that it would be better to have safe sex, it would be better to engage in conversations around healthy relationships that are based on honesty. And so I think that's what Tammy's program is, is about. Do you think people aren't talking because of a fear or a, a shame? Fear, shame, um, the, the message has to, you know, it's, it's a family conversation. So we need to have the conversation at home. We need to have it in our places of worship. We need to have it in our places of employment. So uh, among your friends, you know, so when you're out with your, your girls on Friday night and you're just, you know, engaging in small talk, this needs to come up. We need to talk about 
healthy sexual relationships. In the minority community, are you seeing more youth, like under the age of 15, being sexually active? There are quite a few youth that are sexually active, and not because they want to. You know, we're dealing with issues of um, rape, you know, incest. There's, you know, a lot of issues that we really need to address with our youth. Why is uh, working with healthy relationships and promoting healthy relationships important in your line of work and with the d different departments? We want to um, stop the spread of HIV, stop the spread of STDs such as syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. The rates are increasingly um, going up at a rapid rate and we need to take hold of our lives. We need to um, recognize and realize that we are master of our bodies and we have a right to say no. We have a right not to engage in a sexual relationship if we don't want to. Or we have a right to wait. And we also have a right to use protective barriers which will prevent the spread of these diseases. So there are some um, that's available um, right now. The condoms. Condoms are the number one barrier. and you know, the usage of condoms should be consistent among all individuals. We also have another prevention method. It's called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. What is that? That is a pill that's taken daily for individuals who are HIV negative to prevent them from getting HIV. Oh, wow. So that's a method that's been around for several years, and we definitely want to continue to promote you know, the usage of PrEP among all populations. So you have an event coming up with it being Minority Health Month. Let's talk about this educational event for our viewers. Okay, so on April 5th, 2018 at 4 p.m., we will be hosting New York Times bestselling author J.L. King. He is the author of the book On the Down Low. This book came out about 13 or 14 years ago and it caused a lot of conversation and activity about what is the down low, what is going on, why you know is this important in our community. And the book really um, highlights individuals who live double lives. You know, they're um, they're, they're living double lives. They have a female companion, you know, be it a wife or a girlfriend, and then secretly they are engaging with a male companion um, in sexual relations. So this conversation that we're having with Mr. King on this day, we're trying to promote healthy relationships, promote trust, promote conversations, you know, promote individuals saying, yes, we need to talk before we lay down. So that's what our event is. Again, the event is April 5th from 4 to 7.30 p.m. It will be held at the East Cleveland Community Theater. Um, address is 14108 Euclid Avenue in East Cleveland. And even if someone maybe isn't able to make it that day, they should probably check that book out. Yes, yes. Anything else you think our viewers should know about um, the offices of HIV AIDS services and with the uh, Office of Minority Health? Well, just in, in terms of the event as well, secrecy is a huge issue in the African American community, whether we're talking about a health condition like cancer, whether we're talking about uh, domestic violence or whether we're talking about sexual preference and orientation. And so these secrets are like the elephant in the living room that has to be acknowledged and addressed. It, one of the things that uh, African Americans of a certain age can identify, what happens in this house stays in this house. And it, it's, it's not just among African Americans, but we can certainly relate with that phrase. And so there are complications to that when a, a young person or adult says, I'm a lesbian or I'm gay or I'm transgender. And so these are discussions that uh, often we don't want to hear those discussions. Mm -hmm. And so this particular issue has far-reaching health implications for whole communities of people. And so that's why we think it's so important. What woman wants to say, well, the man that I love also engages in sex with 
with other men. And so busting shame, busting secrets, I think that's what this conversation is about. And so the Office of Minority Health is very proud to be partnered with the Office of HIV Prevention and AIDS to bring this event to the community. And we're hoping that it causes uh, the controversy and discussion that is worthy of this issue given the statistics that we see around STDs and HIV. Yeah, they get uncomfortable, they get comfortable. Absolutely. Yeah. And anything else with your department that you think viewers should know about, especially celebrating Minority Health Month? <laughs> yes, um, it is also STD Awareness Month, so we're definitely promoting um, testing for the event and we want to offer our services to anyone in the community to visit us at J. Glenn Smith or McCafferty Health Center and get tested for HIV or other STDs. Mm -hmm. And how can we get more information? Um, you can reach us on our website at www.clevelandhealth.org. You can make contact with me. My number is 216-420-8641 or you can email me at tjones at city.cleveland.oh.us. Great, thank you so much, uh, Director Mills and Tammy Jones, so much for being here on Healthy Cleveland. I know I learned a lot today, I'm sure our viewers did as well. And for more information, also check out tv20cleveland.com. Thanks for watching Healthy Cleveland. When I first got the cancer diagnosis, immediate thought, death. When you're first diagnosed with cancer, it's just like somebody punches you in the stomach. All I heard was the word cancer from my mom, and at 17, I think cancer, I think death. I was so upset, I was so depressed. I felt despair. I felt anger. I was very angry that I had cancer. I hated it. I felt as though I didn't have much time. I was just scared that I wouldn't be around to continue to raise my sons. And I just felt that I hadn't done, I hadn't completed my job. And I wasn't ready to go. So I was not prepared for what to do when you get a cancer diagnosis. I knew I needed help. I knew I needed help.
The gathering place is here for anyone touched by cancer, and that includes individuals with any form of cancer, as well as a family member or close friend who's on the journey with them. Walking in the door is like getting a hug. And, you know, everybody hugs you when you're here. The staff's amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. The warmth and the support and the compassion and the caring that they provide is just phenomenal. It's like a slice of heaven in the middle of the city. Who knew this was here? So calming, so restorative. It's helped me feel normal. I don't feel isolated. We might not have the same cancer, but um, we all have an understanding of each other. It's helped me spiritually, it's helped me emotionally. It's a lot easier to talk to people that actually understand what you're going through. Everybody that's, that comes here has some connection to cancer, so they kind of get it, and nobody's going to judge or pity you, but you don't get that out in the real world. People just don't get what this, what this journey is like, but everybody here does. I immediately rounded a corner. It didn't take long because I knew that I, I, I had to really have the mindset that I wanted to survive, and I did and have. I call myself a thrive -iver. <laughs> When I meet somebody at the gathering place, my philosophy really is to meet them wherever they're at in their journey. I started one by one, just going and doing different activities. I've done the Reiki, I've done Tai Chi, yoga, the young adults group. Art therapy, the nutrition classes, free massages, and now they have a wig salon. I help people who are wanting to move more, maybe eat better. There's crafting, there's the gardens, there's cooking classes. We make food fun, we make it accessible. As the librarian who will help you dissect your pathology report. Someone will bring in lab work, blood work, surgery summary, and I will put it back into English for them. All of our programs are free of charge. There's so many different classes, so much that they offer here. So you can pick and choose for yourself and whatever fits best with your own needs. The integration of all of our programs, I think, is what's so amazing here. The medical community is now embracing the notion that it is important to really meet the needs, the holistic needs of individuals and their families, if possible, in order to give the best care. The Gathering Place is really unique in Northern Ohio. It's a beneficial environment, and it's a soothing and, and healing environment. I don't think we have any other organization in town that comes close to offering the types of services that they do. What's wonderful about the Gathering Place is that on both sides of town, when you walk in the door, there's a playroom. And to me, that playroom is a message to families that kids are welcome here. And not only are they welcome here, but they have needs that need to be addressed. They don't fully understand the situation, so with Kids Shop, they work on different art projects and playing and stuff like that, and things just kind of come out, and it helps them to deal with whatever's going on with them emotionally. A big part of what we do is teach children how to cope. It really helps a lot of people about how to express their feelings. It helped me see, see watching them coming back home and being more relaxed and more like they can express what, what they're feeling. The resources that are here are for everybody that's affected by the cancer, not just the patient. I'm feeling so stressed and so sad and somewhat out of control. It just helps. The Gathering Place not only saved my life, they saved my family's life because uh, my sons were watching me. If I was okay, they would be okay. And I <laughs> would not have been okay without this place. I would not have been okay. I, 
I wish I never met any of these people, but I love them to death and I consider everybody family. All the services at the Gathering Place are free of charge and it's priceless what people get here. It is just priceless. You know, the saying of it takes a, it takes a village, it definitely takes a community to make the Gathering Place what it is. It just is done with heart, love, and soul. So if you can afford to help financially, be it $10 or 10000 it's all going to go to help somebody have a better day, a better life, a better future. I feel, uh, I feel great, good, wonderful, marvelous, splendid, fantastic. None of this I would feel if it hadn't been for the gathering place. My journey has been made so much easier and been so much more fulfilling because of The Gathering Place, because The Gathering Place does show you that it's about living. It's not about dying. And I know that without The Gathering Place, I would not be the survivor that I am today.